Christ did not come to make men good, but he came to make men free. The person you encourage today may very well be the person that encourages you tomorrow. It's okay, you'll fail. You're not a failure. In the face of adversity, we're trusting God when every voice around us screams not to. That's courage. That's manhood. The bravest moments in a man's life is when he chooses to trust God in spite of all those voices screaming not to. What I was bringing two weeks ago is very different than uh, what I'm bringing you tonight. Two weeks ago, uh, God, God erupted in me on a verse of scripture and exploded. And with the hundreds of topics we have, I try to stay loyal to the Spirit or what I believe the Spirit is telling me. And uh, I'm not bringing you that tonight. The reason I'm not bringing you that tonight is because he arrested me in a very different way about a week ago. I felt impressed to put that off and to bring you uh, what I believe the Lord has for each and every one of us and for many outside this room uh, that uh, I'm sure will be shown on video. Uh, I, I don't think you should expect much. I just think you should expect that which the Lord has just for you. And uh, it started uh, hearing a story of a men's conference uh, that happened, I believe it was a couple of uh, la uh, weeks ago. And at the men's conference, uh, without mentioning names, it was a huge one, thousands of men were there in the Midwest. At the men's conference, uh, a speaker came up the next day and he commented before he went into his talk, what went on on Friday. Since then, a lot of controversy has been going on. You see, what the pastor of this church did, this mega church, is he brought in a, a man the night before uh, to do a strip tease on a strip tease pole and swallow a sword. There was nothing really drastic that was shown that could set people off, but the taste of the strip club and the guy stripping down to everything but his underwear and swallowing a sword in front of a couple of thousand Christian men set the speaker the next day off to rebuke everybody in the room. And what happened was everything hit the fan. And uh, it made me sick, to tell you the truth. I, I, I visibly got sick. I, I, my stomach turned when I saw it because of what the Lord has been putting on my heart. And uh, what I have been seeing, that teaching between the secular and the sacred is, com is, is combining and that there seems to be little difference preached throughout the area. The most prevalent form of of sins today is not addressed at all anymore in the church. Why? Because the church is declining. But the Holy Spirit will never let, allow that to happen. Uh, the devil and his henchmen have tried throughout centuries and just haven't been able to do it, never will, never could. You see, that's the good part. We're on the victory side. But um, I sat down and I, I, I didn't go to the previous verses of preach, preaching on, and I went into Ezekiel. And uh, there's a, a favorite scripture there where the Lord says to Ezekiel, I sought for me a man to stand in the cab. I looked for me. And uh, I read it. And I said, yeah, I've read it 150 to 200 times, know what it means. But I found myself, like I enjoy doing, going back to the previous chapters. God was upset with Israel. And uh, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you what it, it brought up in me. It brought up in me what was going on then is what I'm seeing today. You see, after a year of the launch of the Biblical Mantor, I've had exposure to many different denominations, many different churches, and I mean many different denominations. And uh, one thing I saw in common, men were starving, but the pastors were having a difficult time keeping up with their, with their obligations and with their times these days. You see, you can't bark 
at a leader and a pastor and telling them you're not paying attention to what's important without helping them, without showing them a way to do it. My mentor, Dr. Ellen Lewis Cole, he said, Scott, he said, the pastor's number one responsibility after preaching the word is a discipleship of his men. Because when a man does not discipleship, uh, when men are not discipled, they do not disciple their families. They take their children, they take their wives, and they take themselves, and they turn it over to the church to be discipled. That is never how Christianity was set up to be. And they've put a burden on the pastor that he, that he just, basically he's unable to perform in most churches today. A lot of the mega churches, they can afford to hire people but that's one-tenth of one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent of the churches out there. What about the other 800,000 churches? You see, so we have an issue in this country because the pastor has the responsibility to disciple his men. Unfortunately, he cannot disciple every man. He cannot do it. And the church was set up, as Paul said to Timothy, teach other men to teach other men to teach other men, that they may teach their families. And whether they're men or women, it's just not being done. And the burden is going on the local church, and the local church cannot keep up. Our commandment was go and not make Christians, but go and make... And uh, last month we went over the difference between a Christian and a disciple. But here's what happened to me. I started reading Ezekiel 22, and I came across this verse here. And uh, I'll, I'll try to maintain my equilibrium and not get emotional with you. But I read this verse, and I started weeping and weeping. I got sick to my stomach when I read this verse, and I'm going to read it with you. The priests of Israel ignore my law. Not only do they refuse to respect any of my sacred things, but they don't even teach the difference, the difference between what is sacred and what is ordinary. They don't teach the difference between what is sacred and what is ordinary, or between what is clean and what is unclean. They treat my Sabbath like any other day, and so my own people no, no longer honor me. The message says, as a result, the people of Israel do not respect me. And uh, it was like, this is today, and the Lord was really sad. And when I sense his sadness, I got really sad. And when I sense his hurt, I, I was hurt. And, you know, we've been at this for 27 years. And, uh, see, it's easier for us because we keep serving him. We keep serving him, and uh, we don't get brownie points for a lot of results, but we get brownie points just for serving and, and doing our best. It doesn't take much of a man <laughs> to serve God, but it does take all he's got. You know, and uh, we like to think that we've been giving a lot of what we have and all that we have to the Lord and what we've done here. And uh, as I was really upset, my wife came over to me, my face was white, and uh, uh, she, I really couldn't explain to her why I was so upset. You know, and I don't know that I'd be able to do it with you with, without without the spirit making it clear and with uh, those of you in the room and online who've, who've been with us spending decades ministering to the church and the men. Because men's ministry in the church today uh, has turned into a check the box off for the pastor. They know it has to be done and the men's ministry is a breakfast and very little discipleship ever really comes out of it. You know, I was at Pastor Gary's uh, House of the Rock Church last week. We were there. Man, those guys were hungry. Those guys were hungry to anything, anything. We said, let's make, let's make a covenant prayer what we talked about today. Uh, I put my head down. I looked up. Every man 
was up for prayer, for a covenant agreement for what we have to do. You say, well, well, can't we do that with the women? The answer is no. You will not be delivered from wrong lust sitting next to your wife. Now, when I say you will not, most men, 90-something percent of the men, I'm giving you empirical data, will not be delivered. 60% of the men sitting in church today are looking at pornography as they're listening to the message. That's not me. That's Bonner. That's every research firm that, that exists that Christians respect. How can they receive the Holy Spirit when sin is blocking them? The answer is they can't because they're choosing. They're choosing whether it's addictive behavior or whether it's recreational behavior. They're choosing this. And the gospel is not penetrating the areas that we need it to penetrate. The poor, the less respected, the people who... Who, who are just broken, and we're not reaching a lot of them. And why is it? Because a certain middle class believes that it's okay not to stand in the gap for God, but to stand in the gap for their comfort. To stand in the gap for their comfort. And when I read this, and he says, my own people no longer honor me, I, I felt so responsible. I felt such I felt like such a failure and then I went on and uh, and I read further and uh, it says this in, in Chronicles second uh, Chronicles 16 9 for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro now I don't know about you God doesn't have to try hard to do anything doesn't sound like but it does sound like to and fro throughout the earth that sounds hard to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts is loyal to him. So he runs, says in two other Psalms, God looks down from heaven to see the children of men, to, to see if there are any who understand, who seek after him. They have all fallen away. Can, can they have been that bad? They believed in God like we do today. They have fallen away. Together, they become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Do you hear the sadness? Do you hear the sadness in the Lord's voice there? It also shows us that he works through your cooperation, your willingness. He works through it, not of your own strength, but your willingness and your desire to do that. And then, of course, and then, of course, we come to the verse that that really changes many lives. And it's in Ezekiel. It's a prophetic verse that is used so much. It says here, I look for a man. This is Ezekiel 22, 30. I looked. Now there, look, he, he's looked. There he goes again. He's looking for a man. A man. Now here, here's it. He's talking to Ezekiel. He's not calling the prophet out. He's calling Israel out. He's not calling the prophet out. Because here it says, among them. Who would do what? Build up. Build up what? A wall. Now this was not like in Nehemiah's time where God wanted him to build a wall. This is a metaphoric wall. A metaphoric wall that splits and represents and keeps out evil, keeps out sin, keeps out immoral aspects and behavior. You see, this wall, God, God was looking to repair it. The word for build up here is not to start from scratch. It's to repair that which already existed. So God was looking for men to come in, to stand, to stand uh, next to this wall that they build up because there was a gap between the wall and the Lord. There was a gap. And God was looking for a man to stand before him in the gap between good and evil, in the gap between Satan and God. 
He was looking for a man to do this for Israel, for Israel. And the call then is the same today. What does it mean to stand in the gap? What does it mean to stand in the gap? Well, we already went through this. And by the way, the gap can also be called a breach. A breach that the enemy has breached. Behalf of the land is Israel. And here we go again. So I would not have to destroy it. God doesn't want to discipline. He doesn't want to. He knows it's painful, but that's what love does. Every father disciplines his children. And Israel was going down a path. I'm sorry, Israel's already down the broken path. But here, here's the sad part again. But I found none. What do you think is going up there today in heaven as our children today are growing up with COVID? They're growing up uh, with COVID season. They're growing up with uh, the ice caps melting season and global warming and will we make it? And uh, now the new thing, of course, is World War III. Are we on the brink of World War III? What do you think the angels are saying up there? What, yeah. what, do you, yeah. what, do you, what do you think they're talking to God? I think God is saying the same exact thing. I think God is saying the same exact thing. And when guys talk to, I, I, you know, everybody brings up those, <laughs> those three topics one way or another. And my question is, what are you standing in the gap for? Now, I don't say that to them because they punch me. But, I, you know, I listen and it, there's something inside me that says, what are you doing with your life? You're securing your financial future? You're going to die soon. Yeah, I mean, it's good to do that, and we all need money. I'm doing it for my spouse and my family. We need to secure that. That's, that's common sense. That's called a responsibility, not your purpose in life. You know, I never heard anybody get up and do a eulogy and goes, wow, he was so good with money, and he took care of us, and he left us $5 million. Well, there's a good chance that $5 million will curse them instead of help them. There's a really, I didn't say that the Bible does. There's a better chance to have five million, especially if they didn't earn it themselves. <sighs> Turn to the guy next to you and say, that was a good one for you. Yeah. We had to let a little layer out over there, right, Mike? But I found, I found none. What does a gap stand to look like? What does he look like? What does a gap stand to? See that guy right there? Bobby DeVille, he's a gap stander. He's a little larger than most of us in the gap. Okay, but that's a gap stander. And that's the best, best. Now I could pick everyone out. I don't want, I should probably shouldn't have done that. And because we have a lot of men here who are gap standers. You know what a gap stander does? He sees, whether it's in his church, whether it's in his family, whether it's in his work, no matter where it is, he stands in the gap. He stands in the gap and he pulls people in on Sunday nights at 930 to, to, to give them the word, whether it's 2, 12 or 1200. You don't get brownie points for more. Mm. John Wesley said this, and I was going to save this to the end. This is a uh, it's not a mannerism, but it certainly is, uh, is what he said. Give me 100 men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not whether they are clergy or laymen. They done will shake the, uh, they alone. Okay, they alone. I knew there was a word there. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Do you hear that? Give me a hundred guys, hundred guys who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. It doesn't matter if they're clergy. It doesn't matter if they're laymen. Moody never went to Bible school. D.L. Moody never went to Bible school. Okay, and he changed the world. You can too. You can too. 
but you don't think of changing the world outside of one man at a time. And that's what, that's what we're talking about. You change the world one man at a time. What do we have to do to be gap standers? What is God calling us out? What is a gap stander? What does it look like? What do we have to do when God says, I sought for a man to stand in the gap? What does that mean? What does that mean? I sought for a man to stand in the gap. Does that mean make sure I'm at church every Sunday? Does that mean read my Bible every day? Does that mean pray every day in a certain way? Part of it. But you can be a gap stander and not do any of those three. It'd be really hard to get done, to tell you the truth, without those three. You see, matter of fact, probably be impossible because we need the word. You need the word inside of you. But I got news for you. There was no NIV Bible from Jesus' time until 1,500 years later. What did they do? There are a lot of gap standers. They heard, they had the word, they had the word preached to them, but they couldn't turn. You got your leather Bible over there with your commentary in it, right? They didn't have that back then. So what did they do? Some countries you pray, you get caught praying, you get thrown in jail. But no one could stop you from speaking to God. No one can. And going to church is so vital to be with your brothers and sisters. We know that's important. The gap stander learns to prioritize the needs of others. He seeks not to gather followers, but to empower them. Do you understand that? He seeks not to gather followers, but to empower them. I have prayed the Lord, to the Lord to have this attitude. There are two prayers. I said, Lord, let me fall in love with these men that I speak to through every time. Let me fall in love with them, Father, and love them like you do. And the second thing I do is I said, Lord, let me think of them Tuesday at 2 o'clock, not today on a Saturday or Sunday, what you're going to put in their hearts that you may empower them. They may not think of me. They may think of your word. Those are the two prayers I say before I speak to men. And... Uh, uh, we want to empower men, not to exalt the man's name who's teaching, but to champion the cause of Christ, to champion the cause of Christ. The great Peter Parker's Uncle Ben said this, with great power comes great responsibility. Men of God, you've been given a great gift, and with great gifts comes great responsibility. With great gifts, men have changed this. With great gifts, especially in the Western Christian culture today, with great gifts, men have made great idols out of those gifts. Turn to the other guy go, that was a, a, an interesting one for you. Go ahead. Yeah. G now, Uncle Ben didn't say that. Jesus said that. Here's what he said. For everyone who's been given much, have you been given much? Think about it. Do you feel that you've been given much at 2 o'clock? You know, you're a mature group. The men who are watching are mature because very few people are willing to invest time during the week into the Word of God. Oh, they'll peck at it as they do their email and they'll do it here and there. But to, to commit to a time? I love you guys. I love you guys. You commit to coming here. We meet on Thursday mornings. We meet on Thursday nights. Not the same group, but we meet. I admire you guys. Most men, they can't do it. A week. They can't do it two, three weeks in a row. They can't do it. Why? Because God is not their God. Their fun is their God. They don't know how to commit. They've never been taught how to commit. They may have been taught in business, but they don't know how to stay consistent. I'm not talking about everybody. They don't know how to stay consistent. They keep trying things and they can't understand why they're not growing spiritually. They can't understand why they don't love the Lord more than they did last year. They can't understand why the mention of his name makes you feel like a silly little boy again. When the mention of his name starts making you feel like a silly boy, you know you're so dramatically in love with Jesus. You can't help it. If that's not happening with your life, I, I question. I question what I ask you to question. 
What are we doing? Are we standing in the gap or are we playing, are we staying in kindergarten with Christianity? Paul exhorts the, the Hebrew church, and, and I'm sorry it wasn't Paul's the, he, the writer of Hebrews, and he says, you, you've been kids all this time receiving your perennial learners. Your per, I know we take you to know the Lord, but we're not talking about here. We're talking about here. Experience the Lord to know the Lord. And we're saying, take in all he's got for you. Know the Lord, but don't be a perennial student in, in kindergarten. The, the Hebrews writer says this, it's about time you guys become teachers. What he's saying is, it's about time you guys start standing in the gap. And you know what's funny? What I'm talking about tonight is not meant for those of you who show up during the week for something like this. It's meant for the local church. It's meant for Israel today. It's meant because we got unbelievers not believing believers because believers are acting like unbelievers. And there's no difference today in empirical data between a believer that winks at his Bible, goes to church every Sunday. This is stats. There's no difference between a believer who goes to church every Sunday, winks at his Bible twice a week from the guy who is an unbeliever. Did you hear what I said? Empirical data and scientific data back this. You could go see it on our site. There is no difference between the Christian man who claims he loves Jesus, claims he loves Jesus. There's no difference between the man who goes to church on a Sunday, reads the Bible twice a week. You ready for this? Reads the Bible three times a week. You've heard us go through the numbers uh, uh, of the scientific data on the powerful. There's no difference between the man who winks at God, and that's called winking at God, okay, and just saying, hey, thanks, I got eternity. And you, you probably do. You probably do. But, but how could you take such a gift and, and not maintain the responsibility of giving it to others and standing in the gap and, and working on the Holy Spirit and you not changing your behavior? The Holy Spirit will change your behavior. It will empower you. You'll say yes. You'll, you'll ask him. He'll say yes. Then he'll give you the power to do that. But if there's no difference between the unbeliever and the man that does that, what are we doing? It's like opening up a business and not making profit. And you keep going back to work every day. Sooner or later, you can't pay the rent. Turn to the guy next to you say, it's getting even better for you now. Go ahead. What has been, guys, what has been entrusted to us? Christ-like maturity has little to do with age, but the acceptance of responsibility to what God has entrusted to you. I ask each of you as individuals, what has God entrusted to you? What has God entrusted to you? The Apostle Paul, in uh, two different spots in writing to Timothy, says this, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. You see, what's been entrusted into your care usually is a gift. And that gift, although it may not feel like it, you have a responsibility to. And we have said the same thing that, again, age has little to do with maturity, but all to do with the acceptance of responsibility. It's really about that. God, the good deposit that was, here it goes again, entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. What has God entrusted you to be a watchman on the wall and to stand in the gap on behalf of him and others? You see, everyone is different. Each one of us have different situations. Some of us have been through a couple of marriages. Some of us have wayward kids. Some of us have kids that are delightful and very cooperative. Everybody's got different wounds and different personalities and a different deal, we say. We say, hey, listen, you know, as brothers, the love of Christ, the grace of God always considers what a man has to carry in life before he judges him how he carries it in life. 
And so there's no judgment here on what we're saying. But the question is that God is asking us, what have I in giving you? What have I entrusted you? And if you have a life where you've been divorced two or three times and you're not married, your children have no relationship with you. Now I'm taking the extreme, of course. Your children have no relationship with you. Uh, you're struggling financially. It just seems to be a long season, like 40 years. And you have all this going on in your life. Do you have anything that's been entrusted to you good? Yes, Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, and, is, and the salvation that he's brought to your life. He's made it depositing you. The Holy Spirit is in you. But what has been something that God has given you to be a watchman of? He's called, he's told us to guard, guide, and govern. What are you God in, in your life? What are you guarding in your life? And we're going to go over uh, the next time that we meet about how a man is to stand still, stand God. What does a man stand God over? What is it that you ought to stand God over? And let, let, we'll take a checklist to see how we're doing. Because every soldier has to be reviewed. Every soldier comes for inventory. What are you standing firm for? What are you believing God for in your life that you need to stand in the gap for? Do you have a mission? outside of knowing about God? Because you could attend seven or eight Bible studies. Do you have a mission? Or are you part of a mission? Are you a financial part of a mission? Maybe, maybe God has called you to donate money. You know, we were speaking this morning, this ministry gets the crumbs of everything else that's out there in Christianity. And we've been together for 27 years. Our claim to fame is we're still here. <laughs> a claim to fame and this ministry I could tell you lives on the crumbs of the church and that's what we get because people may get fed here but they still give their money in other spots so we have we have something I, I, I wish I could show it to you it's been part of if what God has called me to do personally, we have a coming soon on our website that was supposed to be launched in January hasn't been launched in six months because we need about seventy five thousand dollars to launch it and I could either stop what I'm doing with some of the leaders and go out and raise it, but then we have to stop other things like this, you see. So what is God calling you to do? Is it calling you to support a mission like Team Discipleship that we believe we could change thousands of lives in thousands of churches? And the good part about it is not from one man. It's from a team of doing this. What has God called you? Is it your brother's? Has he called you to stand in a gap for your brothers outside of uh, lunch and tea and crumpets? That was for the other guy. There's a lot of evil going on. There is a lot of evil going on. And the great commandment and the great commission is really the two check marks. How are you in the great commandment? You're called to know God, to trust God, and love God. And yes, you have to know him before you love him. But you're not going to love him with some head knowledge. You're going to love him with some experiential risk in your life. Like every soldier loves another soldier who saved his life. Every soldier who was ever wounded and got dragged out by a brother, that brother was the honor to his life, just like Christ is to our life. The Great Commission. I can't tell you how many people we talk to that tell us, well, I have my own brand of Christianity. I kind of keep it right here. I don't talk about it a lot. I go, you have any grandkids? <laughs> yeah. Well, do you ever talk about them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you show them. I just got a video. You'd love it. Called me Papa three times <laughs> right before I came up. Messed me up. But how do you keep such joy quiet. Now, you may be an introvert, and I get it, but there's a joy of the Lord that springs out that you may be lacking. I want to invite you into that because God invites you into it. He says, come talk with me. Come let me heal your wounds. But 
There's no shame. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. It's quite all right. Come, and I, and I will do that for you. How do you know if God's calling you to be a gap standard right now? How do you know? In ending, I'm just going to show you how important it is in Psalm 106. So he said he would not destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the gap. Do you, do you, you read that? If Moses did not stand in the gap, that group would have been destroyed. That group, Moses stood in the gap. Now, what do these gap standards all have in common? And I'm gluing this to the question I just asked you. Are you being called to be a gap stander? Are you being called to be a gap stander? Moses, Gideon, Samson, Elijah, Jonah, Peter, and Jesus. What do these gap standards share in common? Every one of them asked out of being a gap stander. Every one of them. God chose them. My point is that we are all called to be gap standers, and many of us don't want to be. I, did, I give you my word, I did not grow up thinking, oh boy, I can't wait to be a holy man. Oh boy, I can't wait to preach the word of God. I didn't know any better at the time. God said to Jesus, after Jesus says, can we do this another way? And I'm paraphrasing. And uh, the cup represented the cross and the crucifixion. And Jesus decided to stand in the gap after God said, son, if we, if we save you, we can't save them. If you're not forsaken, then they will be. So you will be forsaken. We cannot save you. So they will be. And Jesus, dripping drops of blood, can't even fathom what was going through his mind right there. We can't wrap our minds around it, but much worse than our anxiety. All the demons of hell were attacking him at this time because they knew what was about to happen. And what he said, thy will be done. Jesus stood in the gap for you and I. Mm -hmm. Now, you standing in the gap probably will not require your bloodshed. Yet. Probably will not yet. require it. Yet. yet. And if, if it does, we know how many people are going to. This is a call that I'm laying before pastors and speaking. I spoke 50 pastors this morning. Amazing what is going on and uh, from all over the world. And I believe we're in the best position we've ever been because the warriors, the gap standers, are starting to step up. They're no longer thinking of their 401k as their priority, although it's good. They're no longer planning. 60, 65-year-old men, 70-year-old men are getting excited. What I'm seeing, they're getting excited because the best is yet to come with their purpose on earth. They're going to walk through the glory doors of heaven hearing, well done, good and faithful servant to the select group, the select gap standers. Because there's people who live it and their main gear is their comfort and their convenience. And when they see poor people, when they see people of the world, they just turn their head and go to the Yankees like I try to do sometimes. I don't have to think of how bad it is out there. But there's a, there's a select few, a bunch of gap standers that God is looking for, gentlemen. And uh, I believe the gap stander goes by this creed and this creed only. Go and make disciples. Amen. Because unless a transformation of the heart takes place, divorce will increase, evil will increase, bringing more Christians on will not do it. It's like, it's like, 
It's like bring, uh, uh, bringing on folks who are never trained in the army. They get wiped out. Ten soldiers will wipe out a hundred wannabes anytime. Disciples are not wannabes. They're officers in God's army. And you and I are called to stand in the gap and go make those officers. And uh, I just want to invite you. I want to invite you to do that with us. We will talk what has to take place in your heart, in my heart, the next time we speak about this. And uh, we will talk about the twin, the twin towers of what God looks for when he looks for the man to stand in the gap. And if you feel you don't have it, that's the number one qualification. You qualify. But we're going to take you and train you in those two characteristics that every godly man, every Christ-like man has in his life that God uses to stand in the gap. Let's do this. Let's stand in the gap for our families, for our co-workers, for our brothers who we call SEAL Team Partners. And uh, let's make a movement like the earth has never seen because the condition, the state of biblical manhood in this country, in my opinion, is in worse shape than it was in the 80s and 90s before Promise Keepers and Dr. Cole came. It is disgusting and it makes God sad. And what makes God sad makes us sad. In Jesus' name, mm -hmm. amen. Men's Discipleship Network is touching lives by bringing the hope and freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ to men and their families. We want to thank all of you who are regular supporters of the ministry. Your continued financial and prayer support makes you a valuable partner in our work together. If you are being blessed by the teaching of men's pastor Scott Caesar, but are not yet supporting the ministry, please consider providing your financial support so that he and Men's Discipleship Network can continue its mission of changing families one man at a time. Make a commitment today to partner with MDN by scheduling recurring monthly donations on our website at mensdiscipleshipnetwork.com slash donate. Your regular support helps MDN pay for important programs and personnel needed to expand our ministry to men across the United States and around the world. Thank you for standing with us.